the book of James. Powerful book. As we walk through uh, the teachings of this epistle together, I, I pray that God would strengthen you and teach you more about who He is, more about how uh, you fit into His grand design. And um, there's a big picture that God has for each believer to fit into. And it's like a painting that God is painting with skillful precision as an artistic genius. And we are little parts of that brushstroke in the big design that he's got for this beautiful painting. And um, James. Well, the name James is such a common name in the Bible. It's been difficult for scholars, actually. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background to this book. It's been difficult for scholars to decide which of the James actually authored this book. Um, and according to an American theologian named Donald Hagner, there's at least five and possibly seven different Jameses in the New Testament that are referenced. Um, two primary, or three primary ones. Some have supposed that it was James, son of Zebedee, uh, the Apostle John's brother, one of the sons of thunder. But the Apostle James, son of Zebedee, uh, uh, is not believed to be the author of this because... He was martyred in A.D. 44 at the order of King Herod Agrippa I as one of the first people in the Christian church to lose their lives for, for standing up for the Lord. And uh, this book was written after this, according to early church history. And some have thought it was possibly written by James, the son of Alphaeus, which was the second one of the uh, 12 apostles. And uh, he was also original with Jesus. And uh, church history tells us that uh, that's probably not the case. Um, James, they believe, was written by the half-brother of Jesus. Now, according to John 7, chapter, three, or chapter 7, verse 3, Prior to the resurrection, um, Jesus' brother James, along with the other brothers in the family, they were skeptical of their oldest brother's identity as the Messiah. And uh, after Jesus was raised from the dead, however, um, James witnessed what took place and, and he became a passionate and devout follower of Jesus. And he was recorded as being one of the first leaders of the original Jerusalem church. Concerning his letters to the churches, the main theme of the book of James is actually the receiving of wisdom from God's word and resulting wisdom applied in a life that bears fruit. So with that theme in mind, let's begin starting the book off in James chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered amongst the nations. Greetings. So upon this introduction, we see the heart of James had changed from when he uh, was living in the same house as Jesus. And even as Jesus grew up and, and they grew up, things had changed. He accepted an important truth here. We see this. He saw himself as a servant of the Father God and also of the Son of God. He accepted his half-brother now as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And now, as shared earlier, James had been an unbeliever. You can imagine how difficult it would be to grow up in a home with the Messiah uh, in your family circle. <laughs> you know, Jesus was tempted and tested like any one of us, except without sin. Well, the other brothers were sinners. So can you imagine being brothers in a household with this guy who never did any wrong? 
how you'd feel about that, right? So they were reluctant to accept Jesus as the Messiah. But James here, he says that now he is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James calls his brother his Lord. Isn't that incredible? God did something incredible inside of the heart of James to show him the truth. And you know, when Mary must have told him what had happened that first Christmas night, you know, at first they may have found a hard time believing it, but with all the things that they heard and saw, he was fully convinced. So now, Jesus Christ is his Lord. So he writes this letter to the 12 tribes scattered amongst the nations, and he says, greeting. So now he gets into the meat and potatoes of his letter. And he says this in verses 2 to 4. He starts right off saying, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So when we look at this, we see that the natural reaction of any human being who is going through a difficult time is definitely not joy, is it? More often than not, there's some grumbling, some anger, and depression. But the natural reaction of every person when in experiencing difficulties and trials, the default is not normally joy, is it? Imagine for a moment that you lived in a country where believing in Jesus was against the law. Imagine if a militant group of atheists were to come and break down your door and drag you away and threaten to kill you if you would not renounce your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Under these circumstances, I think most of us would agree and recognize that we are facing a great trial in those circumstances. Well, the problem is that in our trials, they don't often come in such obvious uh, spiritual context. Oftentimes, the trials that we face are day-to-day -day struggles with troubling circumstances that come across our path. Troublesome difficulties in relationships with other people at home or at work financial pressures that come, physical ailments which unexpectedly restrict our day-to-day -day routine or some er other area of lacking or inability in our lives. But regardless of whether our trials are the big ones or the small ones, James tells us that God wants us to consider it pure joy when we go through life's bad stuff. And this is difficult teaching. Very difficult. How do I consider it joy to be racked with pain? Our trials can be long, right? Sometimes they last a lifetime. They can be short, too. Emotional, physical, mental, or circumstantial. And they come with various degrees of difficulty. He says here in James here that the trials we must endure in this life will inevitably put our faith to the test. When we're going through it, we're faced with a decision. Will I place my trust in God or will I give way to doubt and despair? That's the question. Now, in my natural disposition and yours too, we can probably honestly say that when trouble visits our door, doubt and despair are right along with the trouble and there are natural defaults. But I want you to see something this morning. God has promised something. As a believer... You see, we don't just walk in the natural. When you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Holy Spirit takes residence within your spirit. You are not your own anymore. You're purchased with a price. 
The precious blood of Christ has cleansed your sins, making you a place fit for God to dwell. And He comes inside, and the Spirit of God lives within you. And there's some promises that God gives to His people. As a believer in the supernatural saving power of Jesus, even though my circumstances might look bleak on the outside, my faith stands on something that is greater than any difficulty that can be thrown at me. My hope is built on nothing less than the completed work of Christ Jesus who gave Himself for my sins and was raised back to life again, triumphing over the power of death in the grave. This means, what does this mean? It means that Jesus is Lord, just as James says, my Lord. Jesus is Lord over every circumstance, even the worst circumstances that I could imagine encountering. God loves me. God loves us. He loves you. And He is for us. He is not against us. And the Apostle Paul asks a question of the believer in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 35 to 39. The Apostle Paul says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are sh considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you hear that? This verse refers to the trials that are among the worst that we could ever encounter. Like the trial of someone dragging us away and telling us that they will kill us if we do not renounce our faith. And if the worst of trials cannot separate us from the love of God, then the diversity of trials that we face on a day-to-day -day basis will not separate us from the love of God either. Do you see? Do you see the supernatural implications of what I've just explained? The application of this in your journey. God desires for us to grab a hold of this and understand what He says because what He says is the truth. Brothers and sisters, take courage. Stand strong. Consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds because God is at work and He's building His kingdom in me and you, and through me and you. He's called us to participate with Him in His grand design of His master artist piece. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9, to the Apostle Peter agrees with Paul and he agrees with James. And he, give context, he gives context to why it's possible for us as believers to overcome the troubles in this life that we have with joy. The truth is that God has given us some very precious and powerful promises concerning the hope that we have in overcoming. The hope that we have been given in Jesus. Peter writes... In 1 Peter 1, 3-9, 
praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though for now a little while you may have to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The promise that I just read to you from Peter, is the reason why we can consider it pure joy when we have to go through troubles. God permits these things to visit us so that our faith can be proven genuine. See, some people say that your faith will cause you to escape troubles. But what the Scripture actually teaches is that God permits us to have troubles so that our faith could be proven genuine. This means that God's children are not left alone to struggle alone through life's problems, through through the difficulties, no matter how great or small. He's given us power, overcoming power in the Holy Spirit. Strength to trust in Jesus no matter what. The end result of our faith is the salvation of our souls. And God delights in our salvation. (laughs) It brings praise, honor, and glory to Him. He created us to bring Him praise, honor, and glory, and He delights when we serve Him, when we bow the knee of our heart to Him, when when we come into relationship with Him and we're at one with Him. He delights in that. And we must understand that these trials in various kinds, some of the trials that we face will not cease. They're lifelong trials. But you know what? That's okay. The Apostle Paul had a thorny trial festering in his flesh. We're not exactly sure on the nature of the trial. There's some speculation that it could have been a physical malady or possibly it was a a psychological thing or a spiritual thing? We're not totally sure, but it was a trial, a thorny trial, one that festered in him. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10, Paul said, that's 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Some of our trials are going to lead us to intense suffering. We look in church history, all of the apostles had to endure torture for their faith. Eleven out of the twelve original apostles, excluding Judas, were put to death for standing, up what they, for, for standing up for what they believed in. Did you hear that? 
the foundation of the church connected directly to the cornerstone, Jesus, was put to death. Man, that flies in the face of some of the false teaching that's being broadcast over the television and internet these days, doesn't it? By today's slick prosperity gospel teachers who teach that comfort, perfect health, and wealth are yours to claim if only you can work up enough faith to believe that they are yours, all they're asking for is some seed money and see what God will do in prospering you. The truth is that these false teachers are more interested in mining your wallet than in the state of your soul. It's sad. It's grieving. It's grieving to the Holy Spirit when he's misrepresented by slick speakers that share these things as though they were truth. This jo- the story of Job stands diametrically opposed to what these men teach. Job was the righteous man. As a matter of fact, he had powerful faith in God. He was the most righteous man of his generation. And God blessed him with abundance. And Satan suggested it was because of God's protection over him that Job was so faithful. He added that if God was to remove his protection, Job's true colors would show and and Job would be a different person. He'd curse God. So God permitted Satan to test Job's resolve to serve him. So we see Job enduring life's some of life's worst trials. The untimely death of his children. Not just one child. His entire, all his children. The loss of all of his material assets. And the painful suffering that racked his body. And even the emotional stress of his partner in life, his wife saying, curse God and die. Through all of this, all of these things, Even through Job's suffering, just as Job lost his children, as he was receiving the news that his children had all been killed. In Job 1.20, we read this. At that time, at this, at this, when he heard this news, Job 1.20, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave me, gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And in the end, after Job's trials were done, the Lord restored his life and gave back to him more than he had lost. You know, it's true that some of our struggles might be thorns that we have to bear for the remainder of our days to keep us from being conceited in some way. But also, there's times where trials come and the Lord restores us back to life abundantly. As soon as the refiner, I believe, sees his reflection in the molten metal of our being, many times he turns off the heat. Our present trials may end. God may, in fact, restore us like he did with Job. But I must come to accept the fact that regardless of whether he restores life here or he heals and restores my life, by taking me to my eternal home, God will restore all things and make them new. This is a promise. God will wipe every tear from our eyes. All things will be made new. When we leave this present state, which is just a little speck on the line that stretches on for eternity, when we leave this little place, God will restore And he'll bring us into his very presence. If we're his servants, he has gone to prepare a place for us beyond our wildest imagination. It's it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. 
The eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Oh, friends, we don't have to worry about the troubles that we see here because they will be washed away. Whether He takes things away for us here and now, like He did with Job and restores us to better fortune than we had before, or whether we meet Him on the other side and take Him by the hand and when He leads us into His promised land. God is good. His mercy endures forever. God has a perspective on all the troubles that we face that is beyond us. We don't see through His eyes. We can't see from the multifaceted eternal perspective that God has. We have this linear vision and all we see is the little things that He's permitted us to see in this tunnel that we're walking through. But He sees the big picture and He's working everything together for good for those that love Him and that are called according to His purpose. And who are those? Those are His children. The church. The ones that have been cleansed and brought into His family. The ones that have been, have been receivers of His grace and, and His salvation. We are the ones. God did this all. Because He loved us. And He loves everyone else out there too. And He calls. And while we're here, we're to be ambassadors of this good news, this salvation. Deep inner peace and joy comes when we submit to the will of God. And that is not dependent upon the ease of the circumstance that I'm walking through. It is transcendent to that because it is born of the Spirit. And the Spirit is transcendent to the troubles of this temporal world. But if we're honest, right? Who can say that I've got a grip on this? Man, when things go wrong, I find myself, whoo, <laughs> I'm struggling, right? I'm struggling to keep my eyes on the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, consider it joy that I'm going through this. Thank you for this great disaster that's befallen me here. We struggle with this, don't we? That's, let's be real. This isn't easy. And most of us lack the wisdom to view the pressures of life from God's standpoint. We so often adopt this short-range view occupying ourselves with this immediate discomfort that we find ourselves in. We forget. We forget that God's unhurried purpose is to enlarge us through pressure, to temper us and purify us through pressure and heat. So then in the context of suffering through trials, we may find that, we are, that if we're lacking wisdom on viewing our circumstances appropriately, because I think that's common for people, we recognize that I may not have the wisdom, Lord, to view this the, the way that you want me to. Please help me, God. Have mercy. James continues this teaching saying this. Okay? And a lot of people take this verse that I'm going to read here and apply it to many other things. But what this, the next set of verses here apply to is asking God for wisdom on how to handle the troubles of life. And he says, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. So James asks this question. Do we lack wisdom? If any of us do, we should ask God to give generously His abundant wisdom to give us His perspective on things when in ourselves we can't see it. I can't necessarily see why someone is suffering that I love. I can't see necessarily why I'm suffering this circumstance or why my boss is such a jerk. I can't see it. God, why do I have to be in this place? It's like this big 
thorn in me. Ah. Well, maybe God's going to take the thorn out when we pray. We can, we can call on him, but maybe he's going to say, you know what, I want you to work through this because my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in your weakness, my son. He may say that. So we must approach God with faith when we are encountering difficulties. Believing that he loves us. Believing that the promise in his, promise in his word that he loves us and cares for us. And that nothing is impossible for him. If we doubt God's goodness and power when we encounter deep waters, we have no stability in our times of trouble. When our life circumstances are all good, then we are good with God. And we draw close to Him. But when the tables turn and our life circumstances become difficult, then we feel as though God has left us alone and abandoned us. And we turn and we push away from Him. And we even get angry at Him. Brothers and sisters, that's what this is referring to. God is not honored by that kind of faith. Such vacillation between optimism and pessimism is double-minded and unstable. And God will not give us His divine insight on how to navigate through the troubles that we face if we're in that place of instability. On the contrary, God desires us to yield to His Spirit and ask of Him without doubt, believing that He will give us the wisdom to get what's going on to help us to navigate it. God's faithfulness to you does not depend upon your state in this physical realm, whether in plenty or in want. Paul says, I've learned to be content in everything, whether in plenty or in want. I've learned the secret to contentment. That's what the Apostle Paul said. So God does... God's faithfulness does not depend on the state of our physical circumstances. As a matter of fact, in verse 9, James continues, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Boy, is that ever diametrically opposed to some of what we hear, isn't it? But rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So the conclusion, friends, is this. We don't trust in God only when we see things sunny and shiny around us. God, forgive us for turning away from Him when things get gloomy and dark on the path that we trod. God desires to strengthen you. James says that if you lack wisdom on what to do or how to react, you should ask of God without doubt. That's God-honoring faith. That's God-honoring faith. Faith counts it all joy when we encounter troubles and trials of various kinds because the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And perseverance, what? Perseverance must finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. That's a promise. So, James ends his thought on this note in verse 12. He says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love Him. Amen. Let us pray.